Charlotte, what AI tools have you started using? So I haven't used the tools that have been rolled out as AI, like ChatGPT, but you know, AI is in Gmail. <laughs> There's AI in our phones. <laughs> There's AI in pretty much everything I'm using right now is like sending me an email about how they're enhancing the service with AI. So I, although I haven't used these new tools that have been rolled out exclusively as AI, AI is very much already a part of our everyday life. There's AI in social media, there's AI in SEO. Whenever we type a keyword, you know, the AI, the algorithm is using AI to create our search results. Like all these things are already very much incorporated in our lives. And I, I have been very slow to start using something like ChatGPT. What are your overall thoughts on AI? All right, so here's my real, <laughs> here's my real thought. It's that I think that these tools look incredibly amazing. Like they look powerful and they look like they could be revolutionary. Like I was watching the Center for Humane Technology uh, on YouTube and they had this, um, they had this piece about how AI can basically read what you're thinking. Like they had somebody look at a picture of a giraffe and then the AI read their brain scan and spit out a picture of a giraffe, which I thought was insane. Cause to me, this means that like people who are nonverbal might be able to communicate, you know, people who can't see maybe be, might be able to see. Like there was a video of somebody that they were using AI to like help someone walk. Like um, they attach some, a contraption to their head and then it sent brains it sent signals to their legs and they were able to use that to walk again so i think it has incredible potential i think it can really like change the world but i think that the stewards of ai have not shown good faith i don't have faith <laughs> in the people who are in charge right now um I just think that corporate interests are so strong in the United States and that we have had a philosophy of growth at all costs for so long that it'll take a lot to reverse that and it'll take a lot to steward this technology in a way that I think is beneficial for everyone. Like, And I don't just mean like in our phones and in our Gmail and things like that. I mean seriously, like because now you have AI. I mean, every time you use TikTok and you use like a face scan that's ai <laughs> that's changing like you know the way that it can manipulate people's voices the way it can manipulate photos and video you know the political tension in the united states just like the the climate of the country makes me feel like ai is either gonna be good or really really bad <laughs> so i think the tool itself is helpful but i think that we have a lot of bad actors in the world right now and i and we don't have a lot of regulation we have corporations that are way too powerful <laughs> and um a, a congress that is super divided and i also think a, a congress that is is much too old to really deal with this in the way that i think that it needs to be dealt with um and i just think that our country is a little bit behind i think that we'll we might be looking to europe to regulate this in a way that is um, beneficial to, to the world in a way that we probably wouldn't look to the United States to regulate. So my husband um, works in privacy, in, in security, uh, digital security. And um, he always talks about how Europe just has such good privacy laws. And um, they also, you know, Europe is like much, much more forceful on making corporations pay their taxes. Um, so that's another thing. I just think that like the tax revenue from this could be something that is used to provide universal health care. Like there's there's just already not a lot of social safety net in the United States. And we already don't have a political climate of people where where there's clearly a lot of political will to create a more um, a more equitable society. So I just I just get very nervous about. AI in our hands. <laughs> like, I just don't know if we're uh, great stewards of it at this time. Well, from the little I know, some of the stewards have gone to policymakers and said, we are concerned. Yeah, it, 
it doesn't give me like them going to Congress to, to talk about it. Uh, Sam Altman, I think his name is the creative open AI going there to talk about it. I'm just like, okay, that's, that's great that he did that and that he's doing these hearings and things like that. But I just think that even long before AI, you know, came into the public consciousness, there's a lot of issues with privacy with Instagram and Facebook as they are. You know, if you look back to the election, the 2016 election, um, there's that film on Netflix called um, the Social Dilemma. The Social Dilemma. Um, and I think there's another film that I can't remember the name of that basically talks about how Facebook, how um, a corp, uh, a, a, how a um, consulting firm used the data in Facebook to help win the election. Um, and, and they've used the data from Facebook to, to win elections in several countries. The United States wasn't the first one. Um, I just think that uh, Cambridge Analytica is the name of that company. And I don't remember the name of that actual documentary, but it was about Cambridge Analytica. And so that was years before AI was a twinkle in the public's eye, <laughs> that there are these huge... Um, leaks in privacy. There's like, you know, Shoshana Zuboff has the book called um, Surveillance, Surveillance Capitalism. Capitalism. Yes. And, and that book talks about how these companies have basically turned our personal data into a commodity, how they sell it and, you know, trade it and all these other things and how our data is the most valuable thing that they have right now. That's another reason it brings me back to why I think our attention is so important because Every time we scroll, every time we like something, we give them data about how to keep our attention. So it's, it's such a huge industrial <laughs> complex of, of personal data that the United States, I think, has been very fumbly with protecting. Um, the, there, that Center for Humane Technology was showing a thing where basically um, they can use AI to like see into your house, <laughs> like to do all these things. Like there's just so much potential for surveillance. There's so much potential for, or like the way that AI is like, um, is used in a lot of real estate now, like whether it's like accepting somebody's application for rental and just like rejecting them based off of whatever the software, whatever triggers the software, whatever, instead of a one-to-one -one human interaction so that you can understand where somebody's coming from, you know, I think all of these things, like people having access to housing, people having privacy, people having um, safety, <laughs> people having like your thoughts being safe from intrusion, things like that. I think there's just so much potential for bad. I think there's a ton of potential for good, but I just don't know if we're going to steward it in the way that is best for everybody based off of what is currently happening, what has currently happened you know, the way that our privacy has not been protected um, in the past. Sure. And it's not always to across the board. Certain communities, privacy are more invaded than others. Absolutely. Um, but aside from those, and it's not to diminish th that topic of privacy, um, what about in terms of creatives? Mm -hmm. Does it worry you? Does Do you, do you feel that um, in the film and television industry, our jobs could become obsolete or these will enhance what we do? I'm not going to lie. I am nervous about the creative side for the same reasons because this the creative side is incredibly corporate um you have these big studios that are trying to find ways to save money trying to find ways to balance their books trying to find ways to um to satisfy shareholders to raise share prices and a lot of times you know, I don't know if this is like exactly true, but you can imagine it that sometimes these these people at the very top are very out of touch with the average writer or like the average like PA on set. <laughs> like they're not necessarily thinking about, oh, we need to create a writer's room for that PA to have a career, to have a way into the uh, industry and to have a way to train so that they can eventually become showrunners. They're thinking about that bottom line. They're thinking about those shareholders. They're thinking about the streaming wars competition and who's going to come out on top, who's not going to go away um, during this time of, you know, streaming content wars. And I think 
a lot of them are hugely out of touch because I think the corporate world, particularly in the United States, is extremely out of touch with the average person. And I think that they don't, based off of what they've done, the way that they've um, tried to shut down unions, the way that they've tried to... Um, how they've they've basically like used inflation as a way to like pinch money <laughs> like to, to take money away from the average person these these gas companies the way that they've raised gas prices even though that you know what i mean like there's so many things that these corporations have done that show that the bottom line is what's important to them that it just makes me think that again i don't know if the stewards here are um trustworthy. <laughs> I don't know if we can really trust them. I think it's really up to us as creatives to educate ourselves about the actual business interests of these people. I think it's up to us to once we educate ourselves and, and understand that we're coming into a business that is about making money. It's not necessarily about the most creative thing. Sometimes it is. Sometimes, you know, you get wonderful projects get to be made, but a lot of times it's just about the bottom line. And it's up to us to determine, do we want to feed that? Do I want to sell my idea to a place like that? Or do I want to try to get it made by myself? Do I want to try to find an independent financing? Do I want to figure out another way. Like corporate television is very much like a regular nine to five, I think. Um, or it can be after you've worked in it for a little bit of time because uh, you're answering to somebody, they're answering to somebody and they're just trying to make a profit ultimately, which nothing wrong with making a profit. I don't think there's, I, this is not about demonizing money or making money bad in any way because money in itself is fine and we all need money and money is great. But I think that these corporations are just greedy. They're, they're, they are, they're <laughs> that is something that we've actually seen. And that's where we are in late stage capitalism in the United States, where we're just doing straight up profit over everything. And it's clearly not working. It's destroying the environment. It's it's making, it's taking jobs away. It's making people fear for their future. We've stripped the United States um, population of, of a social safety net. We've made it so that kids can't, don't know if they can go to college or not. We've made it so that it depends on what neighborhood you live in to know if your kid is going to a good enough school. It's made it so that <laughs> like, depending on where you live, some corporation might be able to dump toxic waste in your backyard and you might, you know, get sick from it. <laughs> like it, we've just completely lost the plot, I think, when it comes to um, profits over people and Hollywood is no exception. And I think that it's going to be up to us, like it's up to us in the United States for the rest of, for everything. It's up to unions. It's up to everyday people to say, hey, we don't want guns in our society. We don't want our society flooded with guns. We don't want AI or we don't want tech companies to have so much of our data. We want to have privacy. We want our kids to be able to go to good schools no matter what neighborhood they live in. We want people to have a social safety net so that if they get sick, it doesn't matter if they're wealthy or if they're poor, they're going to get treatment. Like, I think that there are just such basic things. We want housing. <laughs> we, want pe we want people to be able to afford housing. We want pay to be uh, equitable to living expenses. Like, these are just basic things that I think that the United States is not reaching that makes me extremely nervous to see what throwing something like AI <laughs> will do. Um, but I think technology is great. I think, tech, I think technology can be fantastic, can be wonderful, can help to enhance our stories. I think, it's a, I think it's two sides. I think it's about the way that we move forward. And I think it's gonna be up to us as artists and creatives to speak up about how we want this to be shepherded, just like it's up to us as a society to speak up about how we want our country to go forward. Okay, what if someone says that Darwinism has always been a part of the human experience and it's just now has a new form, which is AI and, you know, the lack of affordable housing, price gouging, things like that. It's just another form of Darwinism. So the survival of the fittest will win and we just have to get on board. 
I think that it is not a cogent argument. I think that it is not a one-to-one, -one. just like the capitalism that we have in the United States right now is not pure capitalism. You know, it is neoliberal, like it's like this um, late stage, like crony capitalism <laughs> where, um, where corporations, it, it's like this social, social safety net for corporations where they don't pay any taxes, the banks get bailed out with our own tax money. If you try to bail out college students that took out too many loans for school, no, that's Darwinism. But if you bail out a bank, is that Darwinism? <laughs> it's not, right? It's like, it's soci socialism for corporations. It's they get to be bailed out because they're the moneyed class. Um, but we don't get to be bailed out. We don't, we have to like um, be subject to the rules of Darwinism and to capitalism, but they don't. If we, if I don't do a good business and I don't provide value, I fail. <laughs> but if you as a bank take risky loans and make risky bets, you get bailed out by the government. How is that the same kind of capitalism? I think that it is just such a twisted way of looking at the world. And I think it's like this very manipulative way of making regular people believe that they are not entitled to any kind of assistance, <laughs> any kind of ease, um, because we're not wealthy. Like we only get to really participate in, we, we, Darwinism only uh, applies to you if you're poor, but if you're rich, it doesn't apply to you. <laughs> capitalism only applies to you if you're poor, but if you're rich, you get a different form of capitalism. So I think that it is a, a very classist kind of way to look at things. I think it's a very like, um, there's a lot of like uh, hatred of the poor in America, I think. I think when you look at the housing crisis, especially in California, you just see, like, even I was in a car talking to an Uber driver, we were passing by like a, 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 like a homeless camp downtown. I'm in a car with an Uber driver and he's saying that these, he's saying the same thing, that these people don't want to work, that these people are lazy and all this other stuff. And he's not thinking about the fact that Los Angeles has some of the, I think Los Angeles has like a billion dollars in tax revenue that it can distribute or something like that. Like t Los Angeles County has some of the biggest tax revenue in the country as a county or something like that. Um, and it's also like one of the places where it's hardest to build affordable housing because these um, landlords are more incentivized to build uh, luxury housing because the permits, uh, you know, are more, I guess, acceptable. It's easier to get it because the permits are so expensive that it doesn't make sense to to build something that is affordable. So isn't that something that the government could fix? Isn't that something that the government can make permits less expensive so that they incentivize or that they de-incentivize people from only building luxury housing? Like, I, I just think that it's a very classist argument. And um, I think there's a disdain for the poor in the United States that is not going to lead us to prosperity as a country. I think once we start letting a few people become prosperous and everybody else has to struggle and suffer just for the basics, um, it's, it's gonna be, I think, repercussions that the United States really can't come back from. Cause right now we're already seeing like population decline. We're seeing like, you know, countries like China um, not replacing their population. The United States, people are not having enough children. There's all these fears about whether or not we're going to have productivity in the future. At the same time, as we're talking about, you know, AI taking away people's jobs. What no one is talking about, though, is creating a social safety net for people in the United States. That includes health care. That includes child care. That makes it so that um, you can you can retire uh, you can you can retire. <laughs> There's people who are in their old age that can't retire in the United States. This is a this is a structural problem in the United States. Other countries are not dealing with this. You know, I moved to Vancouver, Canada, um, and I've been making jokes on stage. I feel like an American refugee. Like I feel like I, I moved to Canada for a better life because there's social welfare. There's social health care. Um, there's public restrooms everywhere that are clean that are accessible to the entire public no matter how much money you make there's tons of public space there's parks everywhere there's bike lanes everywhere there's trains and buses and just all this 
things that help that are conducive to living in, in a good society that I think that the United States are our infrastructure is crumbling <laughs> like our education system is being decimated by people not wanting kids to learn from certain books or learning about the real history of the United States there's like a lot going on that I think is a lot worse than AI and it all has to do with what we care about as a nation which I think is just profit at all costs instead of people. Okay, and last last point, and then we'll move on from this topic, is how much do you think the middle class has contributed to this? I think that all of us are just doing our best, honestly. Like, I think that, like, people in the middle class, first of all, I'm someone, my family has gone from working class to middle class, meaning we went from... I would just say we went from having an apartment building and renting, um, renting an apartment to owning a home. My parents have owned a home for the last 20 years and I would say that that's what helped them get into the middle class. And my parents continue to have to work. My parents, you know, are not people that are gonna retire with a ton of money. Um, I think that the middle class is kind of like, I guess I would describe it as like a moat. <laughs> like you have to do so much to like get into it but it definitely keeps people out it definitely like things like college prices home prices all these things like they keep people out of these better neighborhoods these better education systems but at the same time it's a trap for the people that are in it because you have to work so hard to stay in it